Man, it is great to be back in Fullerton, California. Combat, some mission wrestling. Welcome back, it's been a while. Thanks, man, it well, has. It's been since we started uh, that book. Rough and uh, tumble. When we first started, when did it come out? Was it 2009? Yeah, I think we, we finished writing it in 2009, and it officially came out early 2010. 2010. Because it took some time to have it printed. Uh, but it was 14 years ago that I was first out here and we first discussed writing this book. And if the book is Rough and Tumble, History of American Submission Wrestling. And we want to thank you all for buying the book and purchasing this download. We're going to tell you some stories that have never been told surrounding this book. And we're going to get caught up on some of the legends that we paid homage to in this book, many of whom, RIP, unfortunately, have passed on. Passed on. And when I, we started writing this book, it says right on the back that it was like a roller coaster ride, similar to the old carnivals and the early 20th century. And many of the men who helped write the history of American submission wrestling came out of those carnivals. And we're gonna talk about them, but I wanted to start off by talking about something that we intended to include in the beginning of the book, but we did not before it went to print. And that was Hugo Octopolic, who was a very important figure in American wrestling. And we want to really define that aspect because Hugo Optopolic rewrote the rules in the 1930s for scholastic wrestling. And he banned toe holds. All the submissions. All right? the submissions, arm locks. All the pin holds. Yeah. yeah. All the and things that made people tap, they banned it from wrestling from the. Um, late 20s to early 30s, where it, the acrobatics and all the acting and, and yeah. the gimmicks and all that. But people, yeah. you said, had gimmicks before that for, yeah. car for carnivals like the and the Barkers that helped them out, right? Sure. The Barkers, which we touched on in the book, I learned a lot firsthand from Billy Wicks talking about Frankie Kane telling me about these Barkers. They were your modern day Vince McMahon, they were the guys who emboldened people from the crowd to get in and face carnival wrestlers. And Billy Wicks told me about the man he learned so much from, who was Henry Colin. Uh, Billy had wrestled with McAllister College in Minnesota. He came out of an amateur background and went into the carnivals from there, but he, he learned the hooks, the submission holds, largely from a man named Henry Colin. From the earlier, yeah, from the earlier years. And he said to look at Henry Colin, your average man on the street would say, I could take this guy, you know? And that was why Henry Colin was so successful in the carnivals. Because people looked at him and said, I can take this guy. And they have that rule, we take all comers. Yeah. And you can actually, if you go in there and you beat them, you make money. So there's yeah. there was money at stake during those hard times. And those guys that were wrestling in the carnies that were the wrestlers, they couldn't lose much at all or they'd lose their jobs because it was all about money. But I'm sure some of them probably lost. Yeah, oh yeah, especially when they were in tough college towns with tough amateur teams. And that was the thing that you and I were talking about earlier. You know, I've all these people that talk about purist, I'm a purist catch wrestler because I learned from this guy and all that guy. I there's no fear. No, no, absolutely not. It's a compilation. Absolutely. And, and and I said like when it comes to wrestling, I learned a lot from Billy Wicks. He was like a second father to me. But I learned dirty wrestling. Started wrestling in, competitively in eighth grade. I learned a lot of dirty wrestling through scholastics and in high school and college. I I learned 
what we call dirty wrestling, a choke lot, pins. A lot of the, yeah, yeah. the choke pins were the big ones because you you put your you put your partner in a headlock, and as he's about to pass out, you just twist him quick, and he's three quarters of the way out, and sometimes they'd pass out, yep. and they'd wake up after they got pinned. And one of the one of the first pinning moves that I learned is if a guy's shooting in, and we call it a pancake. And you hook underneath, but, but the way I was taught from my old high school coach is you grab the neck and you twist it, and you step to the side and chicken wing the arm, and then when you land, you twist the neck, and put your chest on it. That's actually a neck crank. We didn't call it a neck crank. And it's a neck crank pin. Yeah, it's a crank pin or choke. You know, they choke call pin. choke pins. But the point is, the, the the idea that in order to be, and I've never called myself a catch wrestler, but in order to call yourself a catch wrestler, even though I won a catch wrestling tournament and had a belt and I learned some stuff from Billy Wicks, I never called myself a catch wrestler because it, get, it, it gets to be where all these guys, they say, well, if you didn't know so-and-so in, in, in England and we in England, you're not, that, that's kind of, that, that, that's kind of BS, guys. You know, um, you're a grappler, you're a competitor. Catch wrestling has such a rich history, incredible history. And that's what we wanted to cover in the book, but it's not all about the labels and the names. It, it's 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 about celebrating the history and homage to these guys that passed away. And I was just looking in the book and Red Bastine. And tell us about Red. Like he's Red Bastine to... was Marty Morgan's uncle. He was he married uh, his father's uh, his dad's sister, and he was a pro wrestler and he used to play with. And work with the kids a lot. Yep. Teach them stuff. And he came out of the carnivals. He was taking on all comers. And I'll tell you the story. We I touched on it a little bit in the book, but I didn't get into it as much. We want to give you this extra stuff. When I met Red Bastine, I went out to Dallas, Texas to meet him. Billy Wicks had set me up to meet him. Eric knew him through, through Jim Morgan. They, they, they said, we're doing this book. Want to meet you? He had me meet him at a bar in Dallas with his wife. And the man, 80 years old, well into his 70s, I'm gonna tell you, he was holding court in that bar. Everybody knew him. He's telling these stories, and I'm, I had a recorder. Remember I had that little recorder I used to carry around? And, and I didn't need the recorder. I was writing stuff down, but then I realized, I'm gonna remember these stories because they're so good. He had a whole new court, everybody's around, and they all knew Red. Because Red, after the Carnies, he went in AWA, he was president of the Cauliflower Alley Club. He trained, interestingly enough, Sting and the Ultimate Warrior. But, but he also had such a dynamic personality. Yes. Everyone loved to be around him. He was awesome, man. And he passed away. Uh, he passed away several years ago. So first thing we want to say is, is, is RIP Red Bastine. And, and, and as I flipped through this book, I see there was, there's several people in that book that we, we wrote about that have passed since. Dick since Cardinal. Was, Dick Cardinal. You've got uh, Bobby Bass. Bobby Bass was a famous stuntman. He, he worked on tons of movies. And he was a judoka and a catch wrestler. And he passed away. And there's just so many different guys that we've covered in here. Obviously, the 12 different presidents plus that were boxers and wrestlers. I've had arguments with people saying that that uh, presidents didn't know catch wrestling, but there's a lot that did. Well, that again goes back to this history that people don't understand. That's why I mentioned Hugo Optopolis. So we'll, just to reiterate what happened, the scholastic wrestling, they took some of these moves. Do you think they didn't survive with the coaches? A lot of that stuff survived. It was called dirty wrestling. By the time I started wrestling in the, in the 80s, it's called dirty wrestling. So the pro wrestling became more show, and the amateur wrestling became where you couldn't use these moves, but that doesn't mean that they weren't passed on on the wrestling mat. I have to say, I, I went to Kenny Church House in uh, Pennsylvania, and I did a little workshop there, and every single little kid that was in that school training in the wrestling room, wanted, they all raised their hand, they wanted to show me their favorite and their best pro wrestling move. Nice. And they asked me, 
if I knew this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy, and they go, I want to show you my move. I want to show you the Cobra Clutch or whatever it was. But it's funny because they all watch pro wrestling. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, kind of entertainment. It's entertainment. When I grew up, it was entertainment. We used to watch all the old wrestlers, Billy Robinson, The Crusher, Vern Gagne, so many different ones. Speaking of pro wrestling, and this is a good segue to this, and I want to get back to, to some of the guys that passed, but Chuck Liddell, I t Rick Bassman told me Chuck Liddell is making his pro wrestling debut tonight in a tag match. I did a, a, a I, I, I brought some guys that were friends of mine at the MMA uh, to do some pro wrestling. Uh, Phil Baroni got him really, he loves it. His, a lot of people don't know, Phil Baroni's great uncle was Lou Albana, Captain Lou, the captain. Uh, Stefan Bonner, he's a natural. He is a natural. Go back and watch Stefan Bonner's first pro wrestling match. I booked him for it in New York, and it was supposed to be against Matt Riddle. And we said Matt Riddle got a case of pussy, I guess. Matt Riddle from Ultimate Fighter. And it ended up being against a Japanese MMA fighter and pro wrestler named Sho Tanaka. And Eric will appreciate this. He didn't speak a word of English. Wow. And you know in pro wrestling, you're supposed to go over your, your match. Riddle backed out Shh. a couple hours before no. the match. They go over their match. <laughs> well, it, 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 kayfabe, this was, this was a crazy story. So we go in the, in the locker room. He doesn't speak a word of English. They went out there and they wrestled. And they tore the house down. They didn't know what each other was going to do. That's the best match That's ever. the best matches you, you have. I brought on. It's too as real as they get. If, yeah. Unless somebody loses their temper. Yep. Or holds something a little longer than they're supposed to. That's another time that it gets real. I was uh, I was hosting uh, Beer Babes and Brawls back in 2011. I just saw Shane Lee. Uh, he was a wrestler for Citadel. I had coached him when he was in high school and he went on to wrestle at Citadel. He's in the middle of his Citadel career and we've been having pops and he had some of his old, his old high school teammates that knew me and they said, you think Shane can take you now? So we were hammered, get in the ring, he hits me with a blast double, embarrassed me. I ended up finally catching him in a cross face cradle. I had a lot of weight on him, but he was currently wrestling. That's in a pro wrestling match. So pro wrestling is not always the word the word fake. It's whatever you make it. It or could work. be a combination of the two. Work with yeah. lots of temper. Yeah, exactly. How about when somebody steals the other guy's move? Exactly. That's another one. They get mad, they get upset about and, and guys will go out and, and wrestle. And these guys that went from the, the shoot in the carnivals to the world of pro wrestling, you have to remember how that came about. And it was something called the stick. And we talked a little bit about the stick in the book. Red Bastine was a carny shooter, but he was also a stick. Like Vern Gagne. Yeah, yeah, the way that, they, that a stick works is, say we're running a carnival. Say CSW is a carnival here, it's a carnival ring. And we wanna get you to come in and face our wrestlers. We, but you might be a little intimidated. A stick is a plant in the crowd who comes in and gives a really competitive match and gets the better of the carnival wrestler. So that emboldens you to get up and then they come in and they stretch you like a rubber band. And that's the way it works. It's, it's money, it's, it's, it's a, a feeder. con. It's yeah. a feeder, a stick yeah. is a feeder. Yeah. It's a trick to get people in there. Yeah, you mentioned Vern Gagne. You grew up in Minnesota. Oh yeah, don't you know? <laughs> you betcha. People don't realize Vern Gagne was the very best collegiate wrestler and American wrestler of his era. And he wrestled guys like Dick Hutton in college. The top four heavyweight collegiate wrestlers of Vern Gagne's era were all his opponents in college, all pro wrestlers. So pro wrestling, you had to be a tough guy. What about Larry Henning? Big old Larry. Larry. Oh yeah, Larry the Axe. And then uh, Bob Backlund. We have Bob Backlund in the book. And, and Bob, Bob Backlund. Bob Backlund used to hurt a lot of guys with this move. Yeah, so, so. His chicken wing face lock. Yeah. You get the face lock and the chicken wing together. And then he have an open bat or dare that people uh, couldn't, couldn't get out couldn't of get it. Couldn't get out of it, yep. And everyone's shoulders dislocated, or they got choked out, or got their neck cranked. That actually leads me to uh, that the story here in the book, uh, which is pretty cool about Bob Backlund uh, and professional wrestling. 
And when he was in pro wrestling, he used to do something that was a time-honored tradition out of the carnivals, where he would take on fans, and they would take the carny challenge and bring it to the pro show in the early part of the show. And he, would, he, he said he never wanted to hurt the guys. He was a, he was a national champion from uh, North Dakota State. He just he didn't want to hurt the guys. He just wanted to get them out of there. And he would, he would pin them. But sometimes he'd put him in his, in his cross-faced chicken wing. But that was something that I think, and I've said this before, they should do again in pro wrestling. Is I think the liability. Yeah, the liability. The liability is too bad. Yeah, you, you get a, a pro, a pro actor uh, who's performing, and then some guy that may have some issue. Maybe he's yeah. got a epileptic seizure yeah. issue, or and in the middle of the match he starts having seizures, or or someone gets their neck broke because yeah. they don't know how to fall. They get knocked out. They get cut. No crazy story. Tim Woods, who was, Tim Woods was Mr. Wrestling, and he was under the mask, but he was also uh, a national champion, uh, Olympic alternate, I believe, and he used, to, he used to do that. He used to pin the guys. He got his finger bit off by a fan. I took him on. The guy couldn't beat him, but he, he saw his rough finger by his Rough and tumble. And he bit it and ripped his finger off. That's like Andy Kaufman. Yeah. Always picking fights with people in the audience. But yeah. the rough and tumble, uh, the grudge matches oh, yeah. were nasty because um, when I got a chance to sit down with Billy Robinson, I, I actually went to, I was cornering one of my fighters, my heavyweight fighters for pride, and uh, I got a chance, I got a Friday night off. So I took three trains to get to a snake pit in uh, uh, Tokyo, and I actually got to get on the mat, and he made me roll with their teacher for about a half hour just to watch. He wouldn't teach me, he just wanted to watch me roll to see if I knew what I was doing. And uh, I got to roll for a half hour with, with his teacher, with the, his top teacher there. And then after, uh, I said, do you have a shirt I can buy? Uh, do, you have, do you have any merchandise, anything I could purchase from you? And he said, I have a, a new book I wrote and uh, I, I said, well, I'd like to get two of them because um, you were my brother's favorite wrestler when we were growing up because you had so many moves. And I, I wanted to get a signed book and surprise my brother with it. And I gave it to him. And he was so excited I gave it to him for Christmas. And it was three years later. I was cleaning my garage out and I found the book that I bought from him, but I never read what he wrote. And I opened the book to, to uh, read what he wrote, I was like, I was surprised I hadn't seen it. And um, we, we got to eat dinner and, and talk, mostly drinking beer. Uh, but you know, when you have a couple beers with someone like that, that's got that much experience, mm -hmm. everything opens up like a book and they start talking about stuff. So I got some historical stuff and background stuff that most people would never hear about. Um, by sharing a meal or a beer or something. So uh, he told me that a lot, of, I said, how come there's not a lot of the old catch wrestlers around anymore? You know, out, out to teach what they learned. He said, well, the ones that are still here, um, they're very broken and they, there was no, uh, people didn't want to learn it. So they weren't out teaching it. That was one, unlike today. Uh, number two, uh, it was uh, a lot of the guys uh, were dealing with hard times, so financially they they had a lot of problems. And another thing that affected them was their health health issues. So, say you got a toothache back then. Uh, if you have a toothache and you don't fix it, it affects your brain. And so some of these guys would go crazy. They would get impetigo or something on their face, boom, their skin, there's nothing that, that healed it. And then the other, they get pink eye and they go blind, conjunctivitis, because they didn't have the silver nitrates to put into the eye. So there was si simple ailments that a lot of these guys were getting little teeny things from, from normal things like ringworm, impetigo, 
staff, uh, pink eye, uh, broken, broken teeth, or uh, rotten teeth. And a lot of these guys, and also financial hardship, caused a lot of these old, old wrestlers to commit suicide. So suicide was a big thing back then because of the depression and the, the financial hardships, not being able to uh, support your family, and then also, you know, possibly getting Parkinson's or or some other thing like that. Uh, a lot of them, he said, killed themselves. That's terrible, yeah. So that's why a lot of them are not around. And the arts today that are passed on, there's a huge historical cat dressing society in Japan because Japan, before Brazilian Jiu Jitsu exploded, it was Judo, Sambo, there was wrestling. But a lot of the catch wrestlers that were still around, like Carl Gotch and uh, Billy Robinson and, and Fujiwara and Antonio Inoki and Satoru Sayama and all these pro wrestlers in Japan were wrestling with the catch style of wrestling and it looked uh, very real. A lot of people believe some of the stuff was very real at UWF, a lot of it in rings. Yeah. A lot of it looked super real. Some of them were re real, so they would mix them up. So the Japanese pro shoots looked a lot different than the American style wrestling, which was more acrobatics and acting and more camera sure. work. Um, the, the stuff in Japan was coming across and they're like, wow, look at all this technique. These guys are actually hitting each other. They're actually submitting and locking each other. And uh, it was going back and forth. So the, the style of catch wrestling in Japan uh, flourished. Oh, yeah. And, and became huge. And if you look at Shudo, which was uh, created in 1982 and became famous in 84, 85, they had the most MMA fights of any fight society out there. Uh, all the fights were pure, 100% uh, real, no rope escape. Uh, if you if you tapped, you lost, and a lot of times, if you if you lost, they didn't ask you back. They didn't understand the fanfare thing. Pancreas got it got it different because if you lost, they would have you back because you're developing a fanfare, and people want to see that. So, so it was just a little thing, a little difference in that aspect. Was Shudo uh, when they when they. Uh, all the fighters in Shudo were not allowed to fight in any other league or organization in Japan. And I said, why? And he said, well, sometimes, again, rings, for instance, might have one real batch and one, one work. Yeah. So it doesn't make them 100% credible. Pancrase had the rope escape, and then, again, if you won or lost, it didn't matter quite so much in the beginning stages. And there might have been some works also. You also had... Um, you had UWF, which was pretty much pro wrestling. Yeah, and, and UWFI actually kind of spawned Pancras. It was the same, the same people. You know, it, it, it's interesting, and I wanted to ask you, as a later world, Pride. Sorry. Yeah, Pride evolved that. Now, as a world Pride team, even in the beginning had some matches that were really fishy. Oh, yeah. And Yakuza. Well, was, uh, so of, yeah. anytime, anytime, especially in Japan, anytime there's a really big show, Yeah. Where does the money come from? Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. So of course, there's gonna be some type of uh, association sure. Uh, sure. With, with some of the bigger shows because that's the backers of the money. Sure. Now I wanted to ask you, Eric, uh, you're world champion in Shuto and you're an American. Did you feel like, how did you feel you were received by uh, other Japanese fighters, but also by uh, the Japanese fans as an American world champion? Well, uh, biggest thing was I was a blonde haired, blue eyed American. So it wasn't, I wasn't liked as much as Chad would have been. Because yeah. Chad looked half Asian. Yeah. He kind of had that Slavic Asian look to him. Yeah. And if he would have been the champion, they would have bowed down to him. Yeah. But because I had blonde hair and blue eyes, I had long hair, and I looked like a biker. Um, they didn't really care so much for me. I had some fans, but it wasn't huge. But I fought, and I, I won a lot of matches over there. And um, how'd you like Japan? I loved it. It was clean. It was pure. And, uh, and women can walk down the road at uh, midnight and not be bothered. I've heard that. Yeah. Uh, you can 
park your bike uh, without a lock and never get it stolen. And people were really honorable back then. And the fans were much more quiet, right? The way they responded to things than American fans? That's true. I was actually in the middle of the ring fighting and we were on the ground going for submission and the crowd was very silent because they like to be quiet and watch and they're big fans of technique. And so like if there's a, a, a big move and the guy catches, they all cheer. And then when there's a recounter, they cheer again and there's a recounter, they cheer and they clap. But other than that, they're silent. And one time I was in the middle of the ring and all of a sudden this guy up in the top rafters, way, way up there, farted. <laughs> you can and hear the whole it. audience <laughs> and this guy yells, Oh nada! And they all started clapping. Oh, that's and, great. and I was in the middle of the ring and I started laughing because, you know, I bounced off all the walls in the stadium. <laughs> that's and all that just shows you can hear you can hear a pin drop and you can hear a fart. <laughs> well, yeah, because just the silence and the respect. I remember yeah. my teacher, uh, Yuri Nakamura, asked me, he goes, what does it mean when the audience says, ooh? And I go, uh, it's actually disapproval, or they don't accept it, and they're displeased, and that's actually a boo. Yeah. They're saying boo, not ooh. He goes, oh, because yeah. they didn't know what booing meant or was. I wanted to talk about Yuri Nakamura, but I also wanted to mention you were talking about fighting in Japan and you mentioned Pancras. Go back, it, it, the listeners to go back, especially the younger, younger listeners, and watch the early UFCs. You had Ken Shamrock coming over from Pancras. You had Dan Severn who did a number of matches with UWFI, and they were your two big stars. And then- Guy Metzger. Guy Metzger came Vernon in. Tiger yep. White. Yep, Ty Vernon White, and then- Jerry Bolander. Jerry Bolander, so many guys. All the guys. Yep. Uh, I just saw a fight. Mark Coleman. Coleman, yeah, I just saw a fight uh, recently uh, between Ken, the first Ken, Ken Shamrock chemo fight, right? And Ken won that with a knee bar. And after he won, he went and hugged Matt Hume, and I realized Kimo was fighting for AMC Pancreation. Yeah, he was over at AMC yeah, for a while. Yeah, yeah, so, and now, if you don't know Matt Hume, Matt Hume also came from Pancreas. So, the catch wrestling lineage in the UFC through Japan is also covered extensively, very extensively, in the book. Yeah, we gave homage to a lot of the, a lot of the, um, well, at the time, the recent fighters, the, the people that were standouts for for uh, the shoot style fighting, uh, and then there's also historical stuff about jujitsu. Yeah. Uh, one one person I don't think we mentioned was Ivan Gomez. No, we didn't. So Ivan Gomez was a was a luta libre pro wrestler from Brazil, and when I asked Satoru Sayama, the founder of Shudo, I said, uh, "May I ask you, um, Sensei? May I ask you?" where you learned your leg locks from? And he said, yes. Yes, you can ask. And I said, okay, so uh, the Achilles lock, where do you get the Achilles lock from? He said, Sambo, Victor Koga. And they go, the knee bar. He goes, Sambo, Victor Koga. Uh, toe hold, that's from Carl Gotch. Um, the heel hook, where's the heel hook from? He goes, oh, that's from Brazil. And I go, what? Brazil, because it's illegal in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. But Ivan Gomez was a, was a pro wrestler that wrestled in Japan, and he was a luta libre, libre yeah. jiu-jitsu judo specialist. Yeah. And he, I believe he had a brother. And, yeah. And the Gomez, they were uh, very tough guys. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, I think they were around, Bob Anderson, I think, knew him, Bob Anderson from America, who trained Holes, Holis, uh, who, yeah, who died in the hang gliding accident, but he learned his wrestling uh, through Bob, yeah. and then the, uh, obviously the team there, and then uh, Sambo also. So he combined a few different things uh, with the jujitsu, which sure. makes it just a stronger system. Uh, and today, I, I even said, I said most most good competitive jujitsu grapplers today are all going to want to learn wrestling. So uh, 
I was training with Rico Ciparelli. He was my wrestling coach. And Rico and I were training together for about eight years. Butcher um, of Baltimore. Yeah, yeah, Baltimore Butcher. And then uh, uh, he was training a lot of the, he was developing a team called the Raw Team, the yeah. Real American Wrestling, which was Randy Couture, Randy Tom Erickson, Dan Henderson, Henderson yeah. Vladimir Matashenko, Frank Trigg, Matt Lindlin. Uh, he had, uh, what's, uh, from from Wisconsin, he had uh, Matt Hall. Matt Hall, yeah. It was interesting when, when it comes to uh, the Butcher Baltimore, he wanted to put up, I, I, when I had my podcast, when we when we talked with Kurt Angle, he said that he wanted to, Ciparelli wanted to put together a grappling match between Kurt Angle and Randy the Natural Couture. Wow. Yeah, and it never, it never happened. Wow, that would have been exciting. Yeah, now, it, it, and, and what Kurt said was, he said, you have to remember, it was when Randy was on the outs with Dana White for that period of time. And he and Kurt himself had an issue with WWF. So it, the timing was really good and wish it would have happened. You well, know? Rico had the PSL, the Pro Professional Submission, Submission League, yeah. and that was spectacular. And he put together a lot of great matches in that. Uh, I was going to commentate that. And then uh, I think Eddie Bravo and Frank Trigg uh, ended up doing that, but what happened is in that in those matches he teamed up some really good guys and he got Randy to go against uh, Jacques Ray. Jacques Ray, and yeah. then uh, there's some really good matches, and then I think there is just a, a backing issue, yeah. a money backing issue. Exactly. He had two of them, and they were spectacular. And then uh, Halleck came out right then came out with Meta Morris, mm -hmm. and then he had some really great ones there and. It's just again the, the financial back end. Yeah. I know Heather standing. Um, I had booked Phil Baroni to grapple for uh, Chael Sonnen's group up there in, in uh, Washington uh, a few years ago, and uh, that one I don't know if that fizzled out too. Uh, uh, his group. Well, there's a lot of them lot are of them. they're they're coming in and leaving, but yeah. there's a lot of now. There's some catch wrestling tournaments which are which are really oh, good. Oh yeah, we should talk Kern about Jacobs. Yeah, Curran's uh, a great young man. He. He's a very talented actor too. Uh, he co-hosted my old podcast with me, and check out the movie he did, Frogman. And he also did a documentary. He's a documentarian as well. Uh, and you're in right for catch. For oh catch yeah, I did, uh, yeah, we did. A, yeah, it was a documentary on catch wrestling, cat, well, catch wrestlers from the past. And there's a lot of guys on there talking about it today. There's a lot. So since we first started this. Catch wrestling has exploded, and there's a lot of new alliances that are out there, organizations that are catch wrestling organizations, and they're all over. Um, so it's really hard sometimes to mention all the different ones. Yeah. We want to wish them all well, though. That's wish right, well. because we're happy to see that it's flourishing and that it's becoming uh, really big. And then to have the tournaments, uh, uh, the catch wrestling tournaments, it's helping for people to uh, get to know all about it. Uh, again, the, the uh, tutorials that are on Instagram and Facebook, they're great. Short and sweet is the best way to do it. And then, and then uh, the other thing is not to sit and argue and bash each other, but yeah. now that we're working together collectively to enhance and to promote. And just remember this, with all the black belts in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu all over the world now, a lot of them are all teaching the same stuff. Yeah. A little bit different, new jujitsu, yeah. but beat them with what they don't I'm know. I'm gonna tell you something. A lot of, a lot of guys I'm seeing today are using a lot of catch wrestling yeah. stuff, and they're borrowing stuff, and they're calling it new jujitsu. Just here's here's what I think. If I was a catch wrestler and I knew all these moves and I started showing Brazilian jujitsu as catch wrestling, I would say I'm using Brazilian jujitsu. So the same on the same token, I believe that. When you're borrowing from another art, say where it's coming from. Yeah. I mean, it only helps the entire world. You didn't just come up with it. It's been around for a long time. It's like the heel hook. I chimed in on a conversation. Someone said, what was the origins of the heel hook? And I, I said, for the origins of the heel hook, from my understanding, it was Satoru Sayama Sayam, yeah. that I learned it from. From Carl Blanche. No. Go, Gomez. Well, from Go, yeah, from Ivan Gomez. Ivan yeah. Gomez. But then, 
I see a statue from the early Greek days from Greece and it's a minotaur and he's wrestling with a guy laying on his back and the minotaur's got a heel hook on the guy. Been around for the old hieroglyphics, oh, yeah. Uh, it's been around, yeah. it's just, we just keep rediscovering sure. stuff. Sure. You know, we try to put new names on stuff. I mean, if obviously if it's originally a new thing, yeah. you know, but a lot of guys are taking stuff from the past and they're putting their names on it. Yeah. This is my, you know, a lot, a lot of people, yeah, but a lot of people could yeah. do that. Yeah. But how about just name the move? There's different names too for different moves in wrestling. There's always been, like I mentioned a, the, a move earlier uh, that you can do a dirty wrestling choke pin with, the, the pancake. A lot of people in the Northeast, we call it the pancake. The cow catcher. We call it the cow catcher down south. I call it yeah. Jayhawk out here. Yeah. The, the reason they have different names is because code. So yeah. when someone reaches over your body and you yell fat man roll, then obviously everyone knows what a fat man roll is. You grab and roll. So we change the name to Apex, yeah. Apex Roll. If somebody reaches, you trap and you roll them. So you're gonna have a code name for different things. So when you guys are competing, you yell it out, the other guy doesn't know what you're talking about. Because yeah. the easiest way when you're in the middle of a ring fighting is to listen to your opponent's coach. Yeah. Because he's telling them exactly how to fight you. So you know, what, you listen to him, you know what he's gonna do, usually. Unless they use code. Yeah, you know what? I, I was going to backtrack a little bit with Luta Livre and someone that we may have left out of the book from the early UFCs, the King of the Streets, Marco Huas. Marco Huas. And if you watch his first match in UFC, you pro wrestling fans will recognize something. Guy had him in a front headlock, came underneath, shot through the legs, body slam. What's a counter in the front headlock? Yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's he used the body school. slam. Yeah. yeah, that's old school Luta, Luta Libre. It's pro wrestling. Yeah. Front headlock, they go for the high crotch, hold yeah. the shoulder up, pitchfork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's amazing if you go back and you watch the early UFCs as you watch the book. Something else that Eric was just discussing regarding uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and taking from catch wrestling, the history of how Brazilian Jiu Jitsu came about is covered in this book. You're gonna love it. A guy named Mitsuyu Maeda, who was called Count Coma. And he was- A French wrestler Japan. and yeah. a judoka and a Jiu Jitsu stylist. Mm -hmm. He came from Japan, he competed in catch wrestling, professional wrestling. We detail he, all the matches. He was a small man and he had, yeah. he had over a thousand matches in catch wrestling. Yeah. In order for him to travel around, that's how he made a living. By the Gracie family ran the carnivals down in Brazil as well. So there's so much, there's so much synergy. There doesn't need to be these stupid arguments of, uh, you know, first of all, what Eric is saying with, with the catch wrestling, something I tell my, my daughter, my, teen, my 19 year old daughter, what other people think of you is none of your business. It's none of your business. None of your business. So who cares what these in your own lane. stupid fight? Yeah, because if you're focusing on what other people are doing, you're never going to get things done like this, like this book and these and all this. You're never going to be successful in your life. So I, my philosophy is, if you're a grappler, and it's a grappling art, learn it. Learn it. Learn the finger locks. Learn the wrist locks. Learn the jumping throws. Learn how to throw. Learn how to trip. Learn how to tackle. Football helps also. I'll tell you something hockey, interesting. Hockey helps also. You mentioned football, and and uh, and uh, Dan Severn was telling me about his match in college against Doctor Death Steve Williams. You pro wrestling fans, you probably know Doctor Death Steve Williams, and he said, and, and Dan was 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 a great collegiate wrestler. And he's a good, he's a, he's a good man, but Dr. Death Steve Williams, who was also a football star and a wrestler, steamrolled, pinned him in the first, I think he said 12 seconds of the match. Wow. And I said, Dan, Dan, how'd he do it? He said, he said, I, he said, man, I think it was football. He said, he just ran over me. <laughs> football, so, the old football yeah, tackle. Yeah. So football, but uh, all the arts, they, they work together, especially if you're a fighter. 
sumo wrestling. We use sumo wrestling to get someone into the cage so we can take them down with a blast double or a standard double or a single leg. But sumo wrestling works really well when somebody's charging you in the, the whizzer and the turn and the uchi. Yeah. And if sumo wrestling's good. If you're not familiar with sumo, we, we used to do sumo at, at, back in high school. Knock the, all sumo is is you got to knock the guy out of the circle. So it's, and, and hand fighting helps you in That's wrestling. That's right, teaching the hand fighting. Fight. Yeah. It's a great, so we, we do sumo matches for our kids. We just take chalk and draw circles on the floor and the kids got to try to get each other out of the circle. Yeah. And it just helps them be competitive with their pushing and with their throwing, counter to the push. Yeah. It's so, interesting. It's so much, so much history. And I, I wanted to, to talk about a man that was so instrumental and me writing this book and, 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 and talking to Eric about it, how this happened. Uh, he's passed away, and I know you're Iri Nakamura, so instrumental for Eric, but for me, he was like a, a second father to me, was uh, Billy Wicks. And you hear Billy Wicks' name mentioned a lot. Uh, he was a guy who would not have passed on his skills at all. He, so to, to tell you Billy's story, I mentioned you know, came up amateur wrestling, McAllister College, got into the carnivals, Henry Cullen, learned the, learned the hooks. Uh, did, he took that challenge to professional wrestling where he, would, he was making money beating fans. And then he had a professional wrestling career. He had a big feud in Memphis with a guy we also chronicle in the book named Sputnik Monroe. There's a great history there. Sputnik Monroe worked the, the carnivals uh, circuit as well, taking on all comers. Uh, and then Billy, practical guy, told me, he said, Matt, always have a job. No matter what you're doing, grappling, pro wrestling, MMA, always have a regular job. And he took his own advice. He became a sheriff and taught DT uh, for years in Memphis. You and know why? You have to have a job because you give back to society. That's right. And, and not only that, because this is your passion. Yeah. If you're lucky enough to make your passion your job, Absolutely. that's wonderful. But if not, give back to society, have a job, to be able to support yourself and your family. Family. Yeah, Billy had beautiful daughters. And, uh, and, and as a father myself, he gave me a lot of sound advice in life. A lot of sound advice. And I'm not talking about on the mat. I learned a lot from him that as way as well, but in life advice. And one of the best advice that he ever gave me is very similar to what I told you about keeping outside forces out of your life. Don't worry, not worrying about what other people are doing and just focusing on yourself and being happy and laughing and enjoying yourself. He loved jokes, he loved comedy. Uh, we used to sit and watch old Eddie Murphy. He loved, he loved old Richard Pryor. He had a great sense of humor. And um, one of the things that I wanted to discuss was he was in uh, Waynesville, North Carolina. He had retired, and uh, he was approached by a couple guys uh, who were who were doing. It was really early days of MMA uh, about teaching again, and that and they they brought him to a place called the Asheville uh, Barbell Club in Arden, and that was where I met him. And uh, uh, he watched me wrestle this guy who's a, a Hispanic guy, real stocky. And he liked the way I was kind of like riding this guy and using my head. And he gave me some pointers on how to do it better. And then we just became friends from there. Wow. And uh, you think he really he, good friends. Do you think he thought that you were Bobby the Brain Heenan? He might have. I've been called the illegitimate son of Bobby the Brain Heenan he looks just before. Like that's what uh, that's what Dan Severn called me, the illegitimate son of Bobby the Brain Heenan. <laughs> and uh, Bobby Heenan passed away too. And it was sad to see him go and kind of deteriorate. So enjoy every day. But what I wanted to say about, about Billy Wicks is uh, when it came to the, I call it like dirty wrestling stuff, the catch wrestling stuff, he, he said, your head, your fist, your um, alma bone, use these as weapons, your elbow. Use these as weapons when you're, you're wrestling. Also your shin, what he liked to do from the referee position is flatten your flat this out, drive your shin in, and constantly keep your opponent in, in pain. And, and uh, what 
Carl Gotch called a sadistic bastard. Yeah, you said this. I just got off the phone with uh, Gene LaBelle. Yeah. I hadn't talked to him for a while. He said he's been in the house since lockdown. Great man. He did the Ford. And he said that he has all these awards and all these all these belt rankings and all these things. He said, but the most valuable certificate he has on his wall was given to him by Carl Gotch after Carl watched him wrestle once or twice and he said, you're not there yet. And he said, what do you mean? He said, that guy under you needs to, he needs to be in constant pain. This is what he said. And, and always fearful of everything that you're doing and never want to wrestle with you again after you're done. And he said, and once that happens, I will give you the Sadistic Bastard Award. Oh, nice. And he said, so the certificate on his wall that means the most to him is the Sadistic Bastard Award, which came from Carl Gotch, the, they call it the God of Submission, who uh, the lineage of the Shudo ranking, all the Shudo from Sayama came from, most of it came from Carl Gotch. Yeah, and, and, it's, and in the book, we get into something regarding Carl, Carl Gotch's history from Frankie Kane, who was another great man who, you gotta read Frankie Kane's chapter and, and, and check it out, because he was a fought, not only did he was he a boxer and sparring partner with Rocky Marciano, a boxer and, and, and take out Columbus Carnival wrestler, he also did the old underground fighting, the smokers fights in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, there was a guy, I just remembered his name, Frank Wolf, who trained Frankie and also trained Carl Gotch. And, uh, and, and Frankie recounted to me, and it's in the book, about he and Carl Gotch having a couple drinks and talking about their old mentor. And when they were in older ages, the great Frank Wolf. So, so many great men that are, and, and really that's what this book is about. It's about history, but it's also about honoring the past and honoring those who came before us. Well, when I found that book in the garage from, from Billy Robinson, I was so surprised that I found it. I was like, man, what a treasure I've had hidden in my garage. So I opened it up and I started looking at it and then I realized that he had signed it. And so when I read it, I couldn't believe what he said. I started crying. Uh, but I made sure I looked left and right and then I started crying. because I didn't want anyone to see me. <laughs> so. Just kidding. I, I, uh, I got tears in my eyes because it's just said, uh, all I wrote is to Eric, best wishes to the last of one of us. And it was weird because I, I went to train with him that day, hoping that he would show me some cool stuff. And instead he wanted me, he wanted to watch me roll with their teacher, the, the head coach there, to see how I would fare and if I knew what I was doing. Yeah. And he was silently, secretly watching uh, sporadically to see what, what was going on and then he wrote that to me and then we got to go share a couple beers and then we just talked about all the stories of uh, the past some of his matches and, and just the his history of catch wrestling and and how their gym uh, the snake pit in in Wigan would stay open 24 hours a day and it was by the railroad tracks and guys were consistently at all times in the morning and night, we're jumping off the trains to, to train there. And he said it, the room was only a little bigger than this ring. It wasn't wow. very big at all. And and people were coming in from everywhere to train there because everyone knew that that was the place to go. And and we should really say that Billy, Billy Robinson's... Billy Riley also. Uh, Billy, Billy Riley, who, yeah. But that Billy, was his gym. Billy Robinson's... <laughs> skills were passed on largely because of, of the work of uh, Jake Shannon and That's scientific right. wrestling. Jake right. does a uh, Jake does so Great much story. to preserve. Yeah. Preserve so history. much about the history of catch wrestling because he got to spend so much quality time with, with Billy. Yeah. And he uh, helped him get out and do seminars in the, the later part there. And he touched a lot of people. Yep. A lot of people were really missing. I also want to mention a gentleman named Mark Hewitt, who wrote, who's a great historian. He wrote the Catch Wrestling books. Catch Wrestling 1 and Catch Wrestling Part 2, which, which are great historical books. They were great for me to read as we were writing this book, Chapman. 
and Mike Chapman, Mike Chapman uh, from uh, yeah, Mike Chapman's a great historian, great author. The, the way that we learn about Henry Cole, not Henry Cole, but Hugo Optopolek, and how wrestling, it's, it's like this, and this is the best way, it's, it's like one, right? It starts as one, and one is the, the old school scholastic wrestling, where you could, you could use all the catch wrestling submissions, right? And then Hugo Optopolek comes along, and he changes the rules, and it goes, it splits in two directions, okay? One direction is the amateur, which I've said, you think those techniques aren't going to be passed on? Your coach knows it, right? You learn from your dad, you learn from your coach, your dad learns from your granddad, things get passed on. And then the entertainment, what became the entertainment, professional wrestling. So it's split in, in two directions. And Mike Chapman works with uh, Dan Gable, who's also featured in our book at the Dan Gable uh, Museum. Eric and I were guests on Dan Gable's radio show on the fan in Iowa when this first came out. Mike Chapman also a tremendous historian and author. So those guys kind of helped us with the, even though this book, we started writing it 14 years ago, those guys kind of predated us. And it's gonna be continued yeah. because everything will be updated and, yeah. and also it's just, it's to uh, bring awareness to the American submission wrestling, which has been here and going on for quite some time. And obviously the Gracies uh, changed and brought everybody from the UFC, showed how how strong the jiu-jitsu was. And so it was a good chance for some of the American wrestlers to come in and try to show their skills also. Yeah. So you have the, the jiu-jitsu style fighters versus some of the catch style fighters or the shooters, uh, shoot, shoot style. When we think about it, Libre or Jiu Jitsu. Now when we think about it now, right? The the grappler today much more closely resembles old catch wrestler because they know wrestling, they know that now they know leg submissions, locks, submissions, yeah. not just not leg locks. Leg so locks leg locks right. kind of tied it tied it in. Uh, I think Eddie Bravo did a spectacular job of yeah. merging the, the leg lock uh, awareness into his EBI events, mm -hmm. and if, if you were to ask me, uh, who looks like who looks like some of the, the Japanese style uh, catch wrestlers in some of the tournaments like the Luminosanto, Matsakurai, Gomi, and Uno, and, and a lot of these guys, uh, Asahi, some of these uh, guys, Minoa, who looks like that today. A lot of the EBI guys do because of the style. Some guys are really good at shooting. Uh, top game players, a lot of them go to their back, but they're really great at uh, intertangling their legs and going for all the cool submissions like Craig Jones yep. and uh, and Gary Tonin. Uh, Gary Tonin to me is like he looks like a shooto guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Shooto style. And uh, and. Uh, I also like, obviously, Gordon Ryan's. Uh, now, Gary Tonin taught uh, Gordon Ryan a lot, didn't he? Yep. And, yeah. And Gordon just exploded and just bang, competes all the time and beats everybody and has a, a you know, his mentor, Donaher, is spectacular with his insights and, you know, and he's there all the time on the mat with them and, and I, you know, they, they have some really great sessions together and, and I, I like the fact that they integrated the legs in, uh, didn't deny it, but attacked it full force. Oh, yeah. To learn it, you, look, you start bringing in Russians and people from oh, yeah. Sambo and, and leg lock specialists. Yeah. And, and a lot of people and learning made. from as many people as possible about all aspects of that game. And Eric, a lot of people may not know this, especially like some of the younger grapplers. So if you go back to early UFCs, Watch the match between Ken Shamrock, who's coming over from Pankers, and Pat Smith. Uh, Pat Smith passed. He passed away? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. R.I.P. R.I.P. to Pat Smith. Pat Smith was a very tough guy. But what I, the, my point there is that first UFC, there were a lot of jiu-jitsu people because it was, it was put on with Gracie. So listen to the booze. 
when Shamrock catches a submission on Pat Smith. Why are they booing? They don't know Ken Shamrock. He's not like a heel coming in, booing him because they always booed leg locks and didn't want leg locks to oh. in, in, in jiu-jitsu, right? Like, yeah, yeah so... The, is that, you know, I got you know? booed. Yeah. In 96 of the Pan Ams, I caught an ankle lock on my last opponent from Brazil um, for a gold medal, and I waited eight hours for my match, and I caught an ankle lock, Achilles, yeah. Achilles lock, and the entire stadium booed. Yeah, it's... And then you have uh, Egan Anaway, I think it was 98, went over to Brazil, and he started leg locking all the guys in one, and they were gonna lynch him. Yeah. And I heard he he had to get back to his hotel, and as soon as he could, he got on an airplane and took off, so he didn't get lynched by all the all the jiu-jitsu yeah. guys. They it, were it, mad. And, and, there, and that's very similar to in, in judo, in sport judo, because I started getting into judo from uh, from wrestling, and I used they to go used to, to have leg locks. A, a leg lock, but also they used to teach leg lock and kind of boss me. Yeah, and they taught leg lock, but also one of the big changes in judo came with a lot of wrestlers coming in and George and doing and shooting singles and doubles. The and then Georgians. they made up they made a rule where you couldn't put the hand on the leg from a standing position in competition because they didn't want the wrestlers to come in. And, 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 and dominate a lot, judo. The, a lot of the Georgian wrestlers were coming in and their grip was over the back and they were using more Greco style. Yeah. Greco and, and the double leg would then just grab the pants and pick them up. Yeah. And just, they didn't want to see that. That you know? changed. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of things that changed. Uh, now you can't do a two-handed break. It had to be a, a single break. No two-handed breaks. Yeah. It's all singles. Definitely, and, and this is, it's so much amazing history. But Eric, I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about Yori Nakamura and just have the floor to talk about because a lot of the readers may not know, and we, we covered a little bit, but we didn't cover a lot about Yuri, and he was so instrumental. Yuri Nakamura came to America to learn Jeet Kune Do under Dan and Asano. Guru Dan and Asano, this is in 1987. 86, 87. Guru Dan and Asano said, do you have anything from Japan to offer that I can learn from you? And he said, well, yes, we have uh, we have Shuto, which was shoot wrestling, or shooting was called back then. And Guru said, hey, uh, to, could you show me some stuff? And at that time, there was not a counter to the tie kick. So the tie kick, there wasn't really a good counter, so everyone was in fear of Muay Thai because you either check the kick, ride the kick, you know, those are, or evade the kick, and, or you step in with your hands. But Yuri suddenly has catch A, catch B, catch C, catch D, all against the tie kick to take down to the leg lock. And Guru's like, well, this is the answer. And then he goes, what about the plum and the knees? And he, get, and he blocks and he hits a hanging arm throw. Uh, and then he gets a T formation on him and then he does a, another hanging it's like a hanging body throw, which is a body suplex. And then he caught the kick and he hit a leg suplex. And Guru's like, man, this is amazing. Would you be interested to teach uh, a seminar at my school? So in 1988, he taught a seminar in, in Shudo. And I remember I drove by, I was in Palm Springs, I drove by and I saw this, this uh, flyer in the window. I was actually going to the Jet Center at that time uh, to do some privates. And, uh, I, I was doing privates with Benny the Jet Arquitas uh, at the Jet Center. I drove by the Inasano Academy to see what was going on there, and they had that seminar in the window. I was also training at uh, here, uh, at, at that time. Uh, I was also training with Hoist and Horian yeah. at that time. In the garage, right? Yes. Yeah. And um, so, anyways, I took my first seminar with Yuri Nakamura in 1988, and I remember my roommate, and, and I, I think. Yeah, my roommate was a blue belt at the time, and I said, hey, let's go to this seminar. And he goes, uh, you know, I'm kind of busy today. Uh, you go, you show me what you learned. So anyway, so I went to the seminar, I came back. He showed 30 submissions on the ground, all these kick catches, all these standing chokes, all these throws, kick catches, slips, body locks, leg trips, all to chokes, and all these different submissions. And it was so exciting because it was, it was all the grappling applied to the tie boxing. And the gray area was the takedown, but there's no gray area with the shootout. 
It was punching, kicking, throwing, and submission. And this is before we were allowed to punch the face. We weren't allowed to punch the face because they wanted you to attack the submission. Yeah. So, so that's when I immediately I said, would you be interested to start teaching a class here? So I started teaching a Wednesday and a Saturday class at the Inasano Academy, and that's when I started taking it. And so I would secretly go to, to uh, I would go to Shudo in the morning on Wednesday, and then right after that, I would, I would sneak off and secretly go over to Hickson School and train on the mat right after that. And and they didn't want you training anywhere else. Is well, they don't. Yeah, they don't like you to cross train. And if you yeah. do, you don't talk about it. So I didn't talk yeah. about it. I never said a word. I was trying to silent. But a couple of the other guys are like, "Hey, you still train over?" And I'm like, you know. And they go, "We only speak jujitsu here." And I said, "Hey, I'm silent about everything. I think jujitsu is great. That's why I'm here to learn. I want to. I want to learn. I. I don't want. I want to learn." And I wanted to learn. And the reason I wanted to learn so much was because I was planning on fighting in Japan. Yeah. And I wanted to fight. And when I saw my first video of Shudo, I said, I want to do that. And someone said, why would you want to do something crazy like that? You could really get hurt. And I said, because I've been doing kickboxing. I've been boxing. I did Judo. I did Samo. My brother was arrested, so I got a little bit arrested with him. And... And then uh, we've been rolling on the ground since uh, 1986 for, for submissions on cement. Oh yeah, yeah. So Man, it, it was a, it all pieced together. It's and, amazing. And that's that's when I just said, I believe, I believe I, I, I want to fight in Japan. I actually wrote a letter and I shot a video and I sent it off to Japan and I got I, uh, Satoru Sayama told Sensei Yuri he said you have an American fighter uh, that wants to come over and fight with us. And it was me, I wanted to fight, and it was gonna be in like uh, 91 or 92, and it ended up being in the beginning of 93, and I went over there with Chad Stahelski. Chad and I were, were uh, we ended up being teammates, and we both went over there to fight. Chad now is the director of John Wick, and he did The Matrix, and awesome. he's done all those. So he got out of the fight business, he got out of the martial arts, uh, fighting stuff to go and bring all of it to Hollywood. So if you see all these great movies like John Wick with all the cool stuff. Didn't you get the opportunity, Eric, to do some work and you were in one of the Bloodsport movies? I did uh, Bloodsport 3, but I, I did movies for about 10 years. Yeah. And then... Um, did you enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. A lot of waiting around, but it was fun. Yeah. Like the final product's cool. Um, and I, I was lucky. I got to work on TV. I got to work on Baywatch. And yeah, I remember the Baywatch. Yeah, but uh, Baywatch, Baywatch. Yeah, that great show. Uh, so, so I really think Eric, we covered so much. I think what we ought to do, unless you have anything else to discuss, I think we ought to close out and let the folks see some of Yori's techniques, some of Yori's uh, because well, it is catch wrestling. Yeah. A lot of people they're in, in shudo. There was approximately 10 combinations, 150 locks. Oh, yeah. 150 locks. That uh, each lock flow was anywhere from 30, six to 30 moves. Sometimes only three. And uh, so it covered a lot of upper body locks, neck cranks, leg locks, everything. And it was all based on flow form because uh, it was all based on transition and movement. And when you're fighting, that's what happens. Oh, yeah. And it's perfect for pro wrestling too, because you've got to put a lock on and the arm yep. changes. Oh yeah. And then the arm changes. Yeah. And then the arm, you know, so. I, I'll tell you, you, Eric, I, I, I brought guys like, uh, that had never been in a pro wrestling ring. I mentioned, I, I got, the, got the pleasure of, of uh, wrestling Stephen Bonner. He did a great job. Uh, all, but also guys like my buddy Steve Alpone, standout wrestler at Anderson College, we co wrestling together. I just grabbed him one one day. I said, Steve, I'm taking you. Sh you know, I mentioned Sugar Shane, Shane Lee. It's very easy. Not for and, I, and not to, to, I love pro wrestling. For an amateur wrestler to do pro wrestling, if they're with a guy that can, that because all you're doing is you're moving in and out of holes, and we know how to make it entertaining for the fans, for the people, and that's the traditional professional quote professional wrestling 
is is taking wrestling and making it entertaining. That's right. That's good for entertainment for TV. But also, uh, have you seen guys wipe out and really get hurt? Oh yeah, Bonner just got hurt really bad at a match in California. He's still on a on a do walker. You, do you know why? It's because you're relaxed. Yeah. Uh, when you fight, you're tense and everything's tight and tense most of the time. But when you're when you're doing pro wrestling, you're like relaxed because yeah. you know that you know you're not. Yep, you're not you're trying to hurt the guy. Your face punched in. Yeah. And and then all of a sudden your leg hyperextends or what what happened? Well, with Bonner, he's a big fan of the Macho Man oh. elbow from the top. He hit me with it, landed right here. Oh, I buckled. He hit my buddy who's competed in a lot of catch wrestling, Kenny Lester. He hit Kenny on the orbital, broke his orbital. So Bonner can be a little dangerous, but the last match he had, he hurt himself. And it's not, the, not a laughing matter. He was in the hospital for six weeks. Oh, man. And, he, and the thing was Bonner, I, I was able to, uh, to be fortunate enough to get him in the pro wrestling world, and he just freaking loved it. Like, wow. he loved it. And he was wrestling every week, and he said he wanted to do independent shows. He was absorbing it. And I, and I feel really bad that he got hurt. So I want to say, especially around the holidays, we wish, we wish him well, uh, man, and that the fight fans will know, uh, will know Biner. But I, I, wanted to, I wanted to just, just say, it's been absolutely a pleasure to get back here. And we hope you all enjoyed this and watch these techniques. But I also want to thank everybody for buying this book. Uh, we put a lot into this book, Eric and I, years ago I did a lot of traveling a lot of interviews there's so much history packed in here and we want to wish you all a happy holidays, happy holidays. and Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas yes to all you guys yes and, and we're gonna segue now to some techniques from Yori thank you thank you very much Chicken wing. Okay. Chicken wing twist arm lock. Okay, this lock. なんですけども、ちょっと解説してみます。フェイス。まずですね。チキンウィング行くんですけど、まあ、からストロング。で、で、強いですから、こういうところ押したりして、曲げたりして、こういう。あるいは、もうすごい強い場合、押してもダメな
頭を持ち上げなきゃいけないからこういうふうにジュージューだけ下がってこうやってこうやってこうやってこうやって,ってでもっと強い場合こうしたらこっちもこっちも引っ掛けない場合ねこの場合はこっちに持ち替える持ち替えてこうやってやってもいいし潰してもいいしこういうふうにやってもいいしここで引っ張ってこうやってで彼,彼が例えばこの場合ねこう押してきた場合プッシュこういうふうにやった場合でもこういうふうにいけるあるいはこっちプッシュやってきた場合はこういうふうにってこうやっていってもいいしここにやってこうやってでまあさっきの続きでこういった場合こっち逃げた場合逃げたと想定してこうやってでこの三角締めはこうじゃあんまり効かないエナジーがこうなってますから<笑> 2位と僕のフィストボーンとネックと彼のトライセプト僕のアンピットが一直線になるようにしてグッとますでまあ次,次、まあ、全部コンビネーションでやってるんですけどもこうして挟んでチキンに持ってくるでその後、クロックヘッドシザーズに行くんですけどもクロックヘッドシザーズっていうのはどういうことかというと彼の首を引っ張ってグッと回しちゃうんですねだから挟んで浮かして引っ張るんですねこっちに引っ張ってから回すこの後こういうふうに立ててここアンピットここが空いてるとヒュッと逃げちゃうだからここをきっちり挟んでここも挟んでこうやってくちょっと斜め上に上がりますでこのフィンガーを上向けるようにすれば一番いいですねでそう,そうは言っても強い場合引っ張るからちっちゃいリストロックでこういうふうにうあるいは彼が起き上がってきたらかまっこのままついてこう行ったりできるしリチャン先行しあるいは彼がこれを足をどけてもきてばいいカムアップしてきた場合でもここにつけてこういうふうに回ってもいいしあるいは引っ掛け直して回ってもいいリチャン先歩してあるいは、まあ、いろんな切り方があるんですけども<笑>まあ大体こういうふうにノースペースですからこうやってやって。こっちやっぱ力でやらない全部技で切りますねあるいはここの膝で切ったりあるいはチョップ入れたりあるいはここを掴んで、ね、これで押さえながらケツを上げて自分の体重を乗せながらあるいはこっちでこっちあるいはこれがノースペースの場合こうねちょっとやりようがない場合こっちを引けばスペース空きますからそこからこういってもいいしそのまま引っ張ってこっちを決めてもいいしその引っ張ればこっちを決まるあるいはスペースを空けて蹴ってもいいで試合になっていると汗で滑ったりとかやっぱ強いですからねその場合切れない場合こういうふうにいっちゃいますでこっちの手で頭を掴んで僕のカーフを首に当ててこういうふうにつま先掴んで三角にあるいはストレートアンボでここからこういうふうにいけるあるいはこの場合こういうふうに例えばこのスペースの場合でも手を入れてこういうふうに首をこうしてグッと上げるでしょでこの手足を入れてつま先引っ張って僕のこっちの足を引っ掛けてこっちに回れば決まりますねあるいはこうやってあるいはプロレス技じゃないんですけども黄色くっていうのがありまして蹴って引っ掛けてトイストすればかなり痛いですからロックは切れるんですビーブアップしないででアンバー行ったりあるいはかなり痛いですからグリッてやってロックだけ離してそれでこういうあるいはこう曲がってる場合こっちを取ってアキレスいったりしますまあこんな感じです<笑> Hey thank you for listening and check the link in the description to buy the book at ericpaulson.com and check out ericpaulson.com for other great products from coach Eric Paulson. Merry Christmas.